Just so you know, most of that was not scripted. Um, <laughs> tell you what. Um, we are going to dig into some stuff today. I, I love Valentine's Day. I used to hate it, okay? And there's something about it that has grown on me over time. And so we are going to kind of dive headlong into love and romance this morning. Um, and we're going to talk about some things. Um, the truth is, I know that we have an audience full of people that are in a lot of different places. Some of you are married for very little bit of time, or maybe you're engaged. Some of you are dating. Some of you have married for a long time. Some of you are divorced. Some of you are widowed. So, like, I know all those things exist. What I will say is I believe that regardless of where you stand, there is truth in all of what we're going to talk about today that will strengthen and grow your relationship with Christ. It's going to challenge you, and it's going to give you some really beautiful things to hold on to and to stand on. And so I hope that you get that. Now, I have to say, just as a side note, because it was the first thing that went through my head when we were watching the video on love songs, how many of you remember legitimately making mixtapes? That's what I'm talking about. When I say legitimately making, I don't mean you pick your songs and burn it to a CD or put, save it to a play. I mean, like when you had to be like, I like that song, I hit record on the tape, and then I hit stop, and then I got to go do stuff, and when you hear the beginning of the next song you want, like you got to run, like dive across your bed and hit record again to try to catch the, how many of you did that? Respect, respect, I love you. You had to really love somebody to make that mixtape, okay? It took some time. All right, anyway, sorry, I just had to get that out of my head. So we are gonna look at the book of Song of Solomon. Now, if you've never read this book, you are missing possibly the greatest book in scripture. It is absolutely powerful, not only for marriage, but as a picture of God's love for God's people. It is really, really cool. It's a great testimony of what God had in mind when he came up with the idea of love and marriage. And he warns us in this, he says over and over again, the writer says, do not arouse or awaken love until it's so desired. He said, there's a right time a right season, a right moment to awaken love in your life. And so we're going to think about that, but we're also going to think about, for some of us, maybe how to reawaken love in our marriages, in our, in our relationships. The reality for some of us is that we have a tendency to settle. Here's what I mean. I don't mean settling for the person that you're with. Hopefully you don't feel that way. But I mean settle for, you know what, uh, life is just about kids and work and responsibilities, and it's just the way life is, and we can't really get any better than that. We need to have a holy discontent for not having incredible, godly, passionate marriages. Like, we need to be discontent with that reality. We need to say, you know what? God has what he thinks is the best for us, and this isn't it. And so we are going to continue to pursue until we get to the marriage that God wants for us. And we're not going to settle with, how's your marriage? Eh, it's fine. It's fine. Listen, if you're going, it's fine to describe your marriage, there is a problem. The problem that we're going to run into is a lot of times we will settle for fine when God has so much greater in store for us. My kids, we, we go to Florida several times on vacation at a particular place there. And the first time that we were there, it's near Tampa, it's called Bradenton Beach. And so the first time that we were there, um, we, we get our kids into this area that we're staying in these kind of like little mobile homes that we had rented one. Um, and our, my kids are, uh, you know, several years younger and there's the bay right there. You can't swim in it. It's got this big rocky area, but you can fish. And so my kids hadn't seen the ocean a whole lot at that time in their life. So they're just hanging out by the bay and we're just like, come on guys, let's, let's go to the, to the beach. And they're like, dad, look, this is amazing. Look, we can throw rocks in the water. I'm like, you're retarded. Like, I, I, I'm like, I, come on, guys. Like, we got to go. And they're just, they're like playing around at the bay. And it took us forever to get them to load up in the car. And we're like going, guys, literally, like a couple of blocks from here, there's like an ocean with sand and waves. It's amazing. And it took us forever to get them away from this little bay area and over to the ocean. And that's how a lot of us are with our marriages. We settle for splashing around in the bay or throwing rocks into a little part of the ocean when God has white sand and beautiful beaches and something deeper and greater waiting for us. And that is what we're going to kind of try to dig into today. The problem is some of you are discouraged. Some of you are disillusioned. Like if you, you hear that illustration, you're like, hey, um, I just want to uh, pack up everything from the bay and just go home. I get that. Sometimes we have marriages that are frustrating and you get angry with those people that you're with. Um, so I want you to do me, a f just hear this. You are married to, and this is gonna be maybe really like revealing for some of you. 
You are married to a sinner. And so is your spouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not good timing, Jeff, but that's good. You know, it's like, I... <laughs> You are married to a sinner, and so is your spouse. So there's going to be disappointments. Amen? How many of you have been married for at least five years? Raise your hand. Keep them up high. If you've been married for 10 years, keep them up. Okay, less than 10, put them down. There we go. 15, keep them up. 20. 25. 30. 35. Some of you guys are checking numbers. That's okay. Uh, more than 40 years. Oh, we got two. Look, look at these guys. Listen. I'll ask the ladies. How long have y'all been married? Like, how, how long have you guys been married individually? Forty-five? Forty-five and fifty-five years. And has it all been problem-free? <laughs> of course not they're, they're married to sinners and so is their spouse there's times when it's going to be difficult but whether you settle or whether you're discouraged or whether you're happy regardless here's something you need to remember about your marriage your marriage is a spiritual war it's a spiritual war marriage is sacred the Bible tells us that and anything sacred Satan hates and will attack. So the Bible tells us in John chapter 10 that Jesus came to give us life and life to the fullness or to abundance. That includes marriage, that Jesus Christ wants you to have a, a marriage of fullness and abundance. But John 10 also goes on to say, to say that we have an enemy that prowls around seeking to devour and that he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And so marriage is sacred and it is under attack. And if you approach marriage as if it's not a spiritual issue, then you're just a sitting duck. You're an easy target for the enemy. It is a spiritual matter. Max Lucado had this quote, and I thought it was great. This will be on the screen. It says, Satan won't suddenly steal your home from you. He'll do something far worse. He'll paint it with a familiar coat of drabness. He'll replace the evening gowns with bathrobes and nights on the town with evenings in the recliner. He'll substitute romance with routine and he'll scatter the dust of yesterday over the wedding pictures in the hallway until they become a memory of another couple in another time. That's powerful, isn't it? Listen, have you allowed Satan to come and steal away some of the fullness, some of the abundance of your marriage? It can happen so easily. Like he said, it's not that it's sudden. It's these very smart strategic attacks. It might be technology. It might be the kids. It might be the work. It might be something relational. It might even be something like pornography that has stole away the intimacy of your marriage. Listen, no matter what it is, there is help for you if you realize this is a spiritual battle. So how do we win the battle? Well, that's what we're going to jump into real quick, is we're going to look at a picture of not always a great marriage, but a restored marriage coming out of Song of Solomon. So I want to set you up, and we're going to be reading in Song of Solomon chapter 7, starting in verse 1. So if you got your Bible and you want to turn there, you can. If not, it'll be on the screen. But let me tell you what's happened up to this point. Song of Solomon starts out well, and then it goes badly. They disagree with each other. They get into it. Words are said. Needs are refused. It gets bad. It gets selfish. It gets prideful. And then there's chapter 7, where after a season of discontent, after a season of hurting, after a season of pain, it's time for a new day. It's time for something new. And for the first seven verses, the man speaks, and then the next seven verses, the woman responds. And so I just want to share with you some of this. If you can read this with me, he says, How beautiful are your sandaled feet, O princess daughter! Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hands. Your navel is like a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled by lilies. You, are, you can read some of this at home if you want to. Um, <laughs> at the end he says, you're, how beautiful you are, how pleasing my love with your delights. Okay, this is like a PG version, okay? So, um, so let, me, let me just kind of walk through some of what he does here. 
okay? He starts out, and you can just leave that up there, and you guys can read along. He says, how beautiful are your sandaled feet, O princess daughter. In our mind, he's, lo- he's looking at her going, girl, your feet look good in them shoes. <laughs> like, he, I've, I don't, I don't, I've never used that line. Like, I've, I've never been like, Crystal, oh, your feet look good. Like, I've been like, is that a new shoe? Like, another new pair? Like, like I've, used, I've, I've used that line, but I've never said, oh, your feet look good in those shoes. Like, I've ne- I don't, so guys, try it. I don't know. Maybe it works. I have no idea. Here's what I do know. Here's what this scripture indicates. He's noticing her. It's one of the most romantic things that a husband can do is to notice, is to pay attention. The problem for me is that I am terrible at paying attention. Like, I am not good at it. Like, it was the thing that my teachers would say to my parents when they would come for, like, teacher meetings. They're like, hey, how's Jason doing? He's really a good kid. He struggles paying attention. Like, it was, like, the whole time I was in school. And so I have to work at it. And I still don't always do it well. And a lot of people say, well, if I have to work at something, then it's not love. That is a lie. True love requires work and effort. Jesus Christ was a model of that for us. He was up in another place sitting next to his Father in heaven. And because he loved us so much, he became what he was not. He wrapped himself in flesh and stepped onto earth and got involved because he noticed that our life needed something else. It's a powerful image. He goes on to say, Your graceful legs are like jewels. The work of a craftsman's hand. You you see where he's going, guys? He starts at her feet, and he's working his way up. There's, There's some smoothness to this dude, okay? Like, he's smooth. He's working his way up. He's helping her, though. Here's what he's doing. He's helping her to see herself through his eyes. Now, that's a romantic. That's passion. This is not how she sees herself. She didn't wake up that morning saying these things about herself. He's taking all of the insecurity out of her. And he's filling her with love and security. And if you want romance, if you want love in your marriage, this is required. We see this love expressed, or when we see love expressed, it draws our hearts in. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that he demonstrated his love for us, that while we were sinners, he died for us. You see what he's going, it's the same thing. He's saying, I want to remove, listen, you are insecure, you're wrecked, you're messed up, you're sinful. I am going to demonstrate my love for you, that while you are yet sinners, I will will die for you because I see the value of your soul when you cannot see it. He's helping us to see us through his eyes. It's a powerful image. He goes on to say in verse 2, he says, your navel is a rounded goblet which never lacks blended wine and your belly is like a heap of wheat. So he starts off the first verse and he's like, man, I got this. And then he goes too far. Okay, like then he start like it's like like guys we do that like we get overzealous and we're like I'm swinging for the fences. Um, That's not listen, ladies, we're trying. Okay, we're not smart, so we're just give us a little bit of credit, Um, guys. We've said this before, but I'm just gonna don't belly heap. Neither of those words should come into play in any sort of romantic thing ever. Just something you should know. In verse six, he says, "How beautiful you are and how pleasing." O oh, love with all your delights. She brings him the light. Now, again, there's verses between these, and you can read those tonight. I, I suggest that you do. Um, but I tell you what this made me think of is it made me think of my parents. My parents have been married for 42 years, and they are gross. Like, they're, they're gross. Um, like, uh, my parents are still, like, like, I don't know about your parents. My parents are, like, my dad's, ne- like, never stopped kissing my mom in front of us and, like, n- grabbing a hold of her and sitting her in his lap. I'm like, Dad, that's disgusting. Like, like, like it, it's, it, in some ways, it made me need counseling. But in other ways... I thought it was so beautiful and encouraging because even after 40-something years, they're still in awe of each other. 
Their delight is in each other. Solomon admires her beauty, and he helps her to see herself through his eyes. And he makes it incredibly clear that she satisfies him. And then she responds, starting in verse 9. Listen, nothing drives a man towards, and just ladies hear me, nothing drives a man more towards passivity than rejection. Rejection is anything that is not a response to his overtures of love and romance. Okay? She responds. She says in verse 9, May the wine go straight to my lover flowing gently over his lips and teeth. So she starts, he led with passion, she replies with passion. In verse 10, she says, I belong to my lover and his desire is for me. That word desire in the Hebrew literally means to consume something. She's saying, all that I am is his, he can have me. In verse 11, It says, come, my lover, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. He initiates, and she responds by making plans. Like she's, uh, he's like, hey, girl, your feet look in them shoes. Your legs are like jewels. I love you. She says, I got a sitter. Meet me at the Holiday Inn. Like, like, like that's, like, that's, that's where it goes. One of the most romantic things that a wife can do is simply communicate to her husband that he is wanted. Verse 12, it says, Let us go early to the vineyards to see the wines have budded, if the blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. What she's saying is, things have not been good between us. And it's time for a new day. I'm going to let the mistakes of the past go. And let's embrace a new season. So what are the keys that we pull from this? What are the things that are important that we grab from this that we can hold on to? If you've been with us in this series, let me tell you, this is not a deep theological series. It is a very simple and practical series. But you know what I think is true of Christianity is that we we love to dive into a lot of times deep theology simply because we lack the desire to be obedient in simple things. And so we can engage in intellectual idolatry making more of the knowledge than of the application. Jesus Christ, listen, instead of you learning five new things that you can do for God, what God would rather have you do is apply one of the hundred things you already know. It's all about making our life obedient to Him. And so what I'm about to say is so simple, and it's very brief, but it's going to be modeled in the text we just read, and it's very simple and powerful. You can use it in your spouse, in your friendships, uh, on some levels, and even with your kids. But you have to do it. And so here are the keys. If you want to have great romance, if you want to help win the spiritual battle in your marriage, the first key is quality time. Just quality time. The nature of all relationships is there, there is a cumulative effect to time that's invested. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I'm built to where I'm like, oh, I want to get this done. I want to get this done. I want to get this done. And there's times when I'm, I'm spending time with my wife or with my kids where I'm like, we're not getting anything done. And it almost feels like you're wasting time, but you're not wasting time. There's a cumulative effect to just being in that moment with them. And over time, it play, pays off huge. And so that means you can't just clock in as a dad or a father or wife, a mom. You can't just clock in and go, I'm here, turn on the TV, look, we're together. No, that's not quality time. That's not being present there in that moment. We have to learn to give focused and undivided attention. That was one of my big struggles in our marriage for a long time. Like, I love television shows, and I love movies, and I'd be watching something, and Crystal would come in, and she would just start talking. Rude. Um, And so she's just like, and I'm just like, I I did, I'm just still going, and I'm like, "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to look at her and like out of my peripheral vision, I'm trying to still keep what's going on. Um, And and it took me a long, like a, a long time to just realize how much that devalued her. And now I hit pause. (laughs) 
because God loves me so much that you can now pause live television. And so uh, God, he made a way. It's beautiful. And so you hit pause and you're like, hmm, okay, now go ahead. It's, it's, uh, but it's, it's all about just stopping and being present. Listen, guys, you particularly, but ladies, this is true of you too. If you think something special, do it. Listen, a lot of us have good intentions. When we judge the behaviors of other people, we judge them by their actions. But when we judge the behaviors of ourselves, we judge them by intention. We judge people by what did you do or not do, not what did you mean. But when it comes to us, man, we give ourselves a pass. And we go, well, I meant this, or I was trying to. We ju- Listen, it's not a fair thing. We need to start judging ourselves by our action and not intention. We need to say, I'm going to, listen, if I want to do something special, I'm going to make a way. I'm going to find a way. It's going to be done. It can be a small thing, but I'm going to follow through. When you think something special, do it. That's quality time. The second one is just words of affirmation. Nothing kills feelings of romance more quickly than rejection or criticism nothing. Show me a relationship where you feel rejected and criticized and I will show you a relationship that you are struggling in. Person that you don't want to come face to face to. Nothing breathes life into a relationship more quickly than affirmation or encouragement. So not only if you think something special, do it. If you think something good, say it. Say it. Whatever it is. Begin to speak. Look at that in Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verses 3 through 1. It's the beginning of what we read. He says, How beautiful are your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are jewels, the work of a craftsman's hand. Your navel is like a rounded goblet that never blacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. He goes on and on and on. He's thinking good things about her, so he says them. We need to, listen, I need to go to my wife and I say, honey, I'm sorry for all the times that you've had to compete with football over the last several months. I'm sorry for the times you've had to compete with the cell phone. I'm sorry for not being present. I'm sorry for not giving you the attention that you deserve. Short of Jesus Christ, you are the most incredible relationship that matters the most to me on this planet. And by the way, your sandaled feet look good. Try. I mean, you got to try it. I mean, just throw it in there. When we think something good, we have to say it. Because here's what's going on. When we don't say something good, almost everybody generally assumes something bad. When we don't speak in encouragement and love and affirmation, and we remain quiet. So for all of you out there, like, I'm just not one of those people that said, this. go to work, start to say it. Start to talk. Start to express it. Because when it's not said, we assume something bad. How many of you could say that's true in your life? Let me tell you what, I've said this before, but it's the worst email that I get ever, or text message, when somebody just emails, and I don't even know what it is. All right, Jason, we need to talk. I'm just, uh, it ruins my day. Like, I'm done. Because I'm sitting there going, oh, they're mad about something. I know they're mad. It's never, and they're never mad about anything. But I always assume the worst thing. Just me? Insecure? Okay, got it. All right, fine. And listen, we need to find ways in our relationships to turn down criticism and turn up encouragement. It not only changes how your spouse feels, but it changes how you feel about your spouse. Because now you're actively looking for things that you love in them. You're looking. Listen, if you want to find reasons to criticize, can you find them? Always. It's all a matter of what you're looking for. If you're looking for negatives, you'll find them every time. But if you go into it going, I want to find, listen, every day when he comes home, when she comes home, every time we wake up in the morning, the first thing I'm going to think of is what's one really great thing about them I can say right now. Man, do that with your kids. It might change how your mornings go completely. The reason that we do all this is because we have an ultimate example of love for us. That is obviously 
Jesus Christ. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He says, when you were the most unlovable, when you were the least attractive, when you were the least desirable, Jesus says, I love you. And you know what that does for us? It frees us up to love other people. I don't know any factor more important in marriage and romance than experiencing the love of Jesus Christ in your individual life. See, if I've experienced the love of Christ, then I know what forgiveness looks like and I know how to offer it. If I've experienced the love of Jesus Christ, then I know mercy and so I can give mercy. If I've experienced the love of Jesus Christ, I know what it means to be affirmed. I know what it means to be encouraged. I know what it means to be loved in the worst and the darkest of my moments. And so now I can love others in the worst and darkest of their moments. I know what it looks like for me to have made a horrible decision and still have a father that loves me. And so I can still be a father that loves in the midst of a horrible decision. The most important thing that you can do for your marriage is to love Jesus Christ more than anything else. Listen, I know that we want to believe that what Jesus' great desire for us in this world is to be happy. To find our person and to be happy. Listen, he is so much less concerned about that than we can possibly imagine. You know what Jesus is concerned about? Jesus is concerned that you live up to be the dream that he created in you. That you live to the purpose that he intended for you. And if we live to the purpose that God intended when he molded us, when he wove us together inside of the womb, when we live to fulfill that purpose of God, listen, we might then really become attractive to the person who needs us to be attractive to them. If I listen, the, the most excited my wife should ever get when she looks at me is when she sees me chase him more than anything else. She ought to go, I mean, like, listen, women in the, listen, women of God should get straight up weak in the knees when their husband's chasing after Jesus Christ. And guys, when you're, listen, when my wife came up here and spoke like a couple of weeks ago with me and you guys like packed out the church for two services, um, like, it, I, like I, I, listen, you were enamored with her. I went home and all day long I was like, oh my gosh, she is so incredible. And that's all I could think about. My love for God increases my ability to love elsewhere. That's why this expression of love is so important. We need to become who God dreamed for our life. We need to fall in love with him and pursue the goals, the passions, the life that he has for us. And when we do, relationships work. If, listen, if the relationship we have with God isn't working, then no other relationship stands a chance. So the best thing you can do for your marriage is to full on love Jesus Christ. I want, you to, I want you to hear this. In, in the Gospel of John, something like 30, I think 37 times, he says um, the word love. And, and then several other times he uses this phrase, I am loved by God. Like I, I think John, John, I think I see John as like just kind of a, a, a renaissance man of the disciples. Like he's a little bit sappy and a little bit emotional and he just kind of is always overwhelmed by the fact that God is like likes him at all like he's constantly just going I'm blown away that you love me period so I want you to hear this it said again over 40 times these phrases or this word this concept is used in the gospel of John I am loved by God and when you do me a favor I want you to say that with me okay let's say that together I am loved by God there are some people in this room that don't feel loved by anybody but you're loved by God You might be in a relationship that's struggling right now. Listen, you are loved by God. You might be at the worst moment of your life spiritually, and you are loved by God. You might have walked in this room, and you go, man, I'm not even into this whole God thing. I got in here because somebody drugged me in here, and I'm ready to get out as fast as I can. That's cool, man. You are still, I don't want, I don't like his love. Too bad. You can't stop it. You are loved by God. And when you get that, 
loving your spouse, loving other people becomes natural. It becomes easy. Amen? I want you to pray with me. Can you just, right now, if you've got, if, you're, if you are um, married or engaged or dating and you've got that person next to you or maybe you're a parent, you've got a kid next to you, can you just grab their hands right now? Just hold on to them. I know it's corny. I know it's cheesy. I know if you've a teenager, they're probably going, oh, this is gross, and that's cool. They were going to say that no matter what we did, so it's cool. And I want you just for a moment to pray for the person that you're holding on to, the people that you're holding on to. Pray for your, your spouse. Pray for your marriage. Pray for your family. Just say, God, ignite passion and love in our home. Pray that God would help each of you to love him like nothing else because that's the greatest way that everything else gets better. It's the best way. Love is such a powerful thing. The Bible says, and now these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. It's the shared expression of affection. It's the shared encouragement and affirmation. It is the shared building up and forgiving of other people to love them well. It's God's ultimate path for us out of darkness and into light. The Bible says that greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends and our Father did just that. So if you're here today and you're going, you know, my relationships are a struggle, I would ask you, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If not, today could be an opportunity for you to have the greatest Valentine's Day ever, to experience real love for the first time. For others, maybe you go, you know, I have a relationship with Christ, but it's not where it needs to be. And because my relationship with Christ is not where it needs to be, I'm struggling in my, to love my spouse well. I'm struggling to love my kids well. I'm struggling to love my friends well. I'm struggling to love my coworkers well. And I know that it's spiritual. And I need to learn to love God again. God, whatever our prayer, I pray that you would speak to us today. This altar is open if we just want to come and pour out our affection and love for you. If we want to come, God, and surrender, repent, and just say, God, I, I need to learn to love you again, to feel your love. God, whatever it is, call us this morning. Call us to our knees in love and obedience and renew the love we have for you. We are your sons and daughters. We are the children of the Most High. We are adopted by our Father who chose us and loves us. We are not slaves to sin. We are sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords who in his great love for us died to set us free. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together.